we'll hear some students discussing an assignment about zoos. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Hello, Brenda. How are you doing? Fine. I've just come over to talk about this assignment on the function of zoos. Oh, hello, Charles. Hello, Brenda. That's good. I've just been in the library looking at some stuff. I think Adrian's been on the web. Yes, I have. Well, that's great. What have you found out about zoos? I've been looking into the history both of zoos and of keeping animals generally. I didn't think we had to do that. Yes, it was one of the topics we had to research. We definitely need to cover it, even if only briefly. I think, after all, people have kept animals for recreation and pleasure for centuries. The ancient Egyptians kept collections of animals, and of course, the Romans kept animals for recreation. Ah, the Romans. That brings us to the general question of the treatment of animals and the mistreatment of them.、Uh, yes, but that's not our topic. We've been told to keep off that. Now, where were we? Our assignment is concerned with the purposes of zoos in general and in our modern era. We have to cover the history, but not in great depth. Our main focus is the scientific aspects of zoos and the work they do for conservation and so on. We mustn't forget the question of who pays for them.、Mm. Zoos are hugely expensive places to run nowadays. There are the costs of feeding the animals, obviously, and security for the animals and the public. What happens if they escaped and so on? We have to ask what benefits we get from this, Adrian. I don't think you'll find we have to do that kind of thing at all. But I've been looking into all that and the social benefits of zoos. What I mean is that's not part of this assignment. All this financial and safety stuff is not necessary. We should stick to their purposes. Now, what have you found out, Charles? Well, I discovered that the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums was very helpful on this. I've got their website address here somewhere. I found out about the scientific research that zoos do.、Uh, the other thing we should cover is the educational side of their work. The educational side is pretty obvious. I've got lots of stuff here about this, and more references to websites and information. There's also the area of entertainment. What about that?、Mm, he's got a point. I think we need to do some more research on that. Fine, but it sounds like we've covered the history and science angles pretty well. I agree. Let's leave those for now and plan some more study on the entertainment stuff. And let's do some more work on the conservation element. Now answer questions six to ten. Now answer questions six to ten. Oh yes, the Arabian oryx is a classic case. The what? The Arabian oryx. It's like a deer but white.、Mm. That is, it has a white body but brown legs and long curved horns. It normally lives in the hot desert in the Arabian Peninsula. Anyway, in the seventies, the population declined. And in 1972, the last wild oryx was shot, and it became extinct in the wild. There were a few left in zoos in the United States, where there was a captive breeding program. This was so successful that in 1982, a small population was reintroduced into the wild. Hunting of wild animals was made illegal, and there are now about 300 in Amman.、Oh. Although there was a big problem there, I believe. The population went up to about 450 in the 90s, and then illegal hunting did take place. The population crashed again, and the programs had to be restarted. But that's been successful, and there are now, I believe, as you say, several hundred in the wild. This is all available on the websites that Adrian has noted. There was a similar program in Saudi Arabia, and I think there are hundreds in the desert there now.
We can use that as a definite success story. And what have you found out? Yes, what have you come up with? I'm going to the library now. Good. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a lecturer talking to students about a printing process. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. As I've made clear in earlier lectures, many different solutions have been proposed to the basic technological problem of getting meaningful marks onto paper. In other words, several different forms of printing have developed over the years, many of which are still in use today for different purposes. This week, I'd like to discuss the rotogravure process. This is one of the most widely used printing processes, and after describing how the process works, I'll be describing some of its industrial uses and the advantages and disadvantages of this form of printing. As the name implies, rotogravure is a form of printing in which large cylindrical pieces of metal rotate, while the paper to be printed passes between them. The paper is held in place against the printing surface by the impression roller. The weight of this roller is one of the factors that affect how much ink is actually transferred to the paper. Remember that this roller does not directly transfer ink onto the paper. The side in contact with the impression roller remains blank, and it's the other side of the paper which is actually the printed side. The impression roller presses the paper against the ink-bearing roller generally known as the gravure cylinder. This roller is etched or engraved using either a laser or a diamond-tipped etching machine. This creates a large number of tiny holes in the surface of the roller which hold the ink. The depth and size of these holes determines how much ink is picked up from the ink fountain, which the whole printing assembly rests in. How much ink is picked up in turn determines the density of the image produced. As it rotates, the lower roller picks up more ink on its surface than is required, and this needs to be removed before contact with the paper. A flat edge, called the doctor blade, scrapes against the surface and removes all ink which is not in one of the holes on the surface of the lower roller. This should lead to a clean image. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now that we understand a little of the mechanics of rotogravure printing, I'd like to look at it in the wider context of the printing industry and discuss the main uses. One of the main advantages of the rotogravure process is that the amount of ink which can be transferred to the paper is high compared to other printing methods. This means that a broad density range can be produced. In other words, with rotogravure, 
it's possible to produce many different light and dark shades, making it particularly suitable for reproducing photographs and fine art. For shorter print runs, some other processes may give a finer image, but rotogravure is ideal for jobs that involve printing, for example, a million magazines. One commonplace where you'll see printed matter that has been produced by rotogravure is in the advertising material that is often inserted into Sunday newspapers. Of course, it's not just paper that can be printed by rotogravure. It's a very flexible process, since the rollers used can be made to any size required. Whether it's consumer packaging or large rolls of floor covering that need to be printed, rotogravure is a relatively cheap, quick method that is used in a variety of industries. This isn't to say that rotogravure is without its disadvantages. Probably the main drawback is the fact that, with large areas of colour, the dots are visible, even without using any kind of magnifying aid. Now, does anyone have any questions about the rotogravure process? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3 You will hear two engineering students, a woman in her sixth year called Linda and a man in his fifth year called Matthew, discussing the benefits of student work placements. Before you listen, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 26. Hi, Linda. Can you spare a few minutes? Hello, Matthew. No problem. I just wanted to talk to you about temporary work placements. I've never really thought there was a good reason for doing one. I've got some savings, so I don't really need the money at the moment. But I've had an email from the university about a vacancy that looks quite interesting. You did a placement last year, didn't you? I did, yes. In my case, I wanted to find out if I was making the right career choice before I began applying for permanent jobs. I thought I wanted to work in car manufacturing, but I wasn't sure, so I applied to Toyota. What was the application process like? Lengthy. There were a lot of different parts to it. The dullest one was a psychometric test. You know, when you have to answer loads of questions about yourself. And you're trying to guess what's the best thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Then there was an activity that we did in groups, which I found really fascinating. Engineers are renowned for being a bit unsociable, but I thought we made a great team. And we had an individual task, too. We had to sort through various business documents and prioritize them. It was just like what you have to do as a student, really, just with different content. What exactly were you doing on the placement? I was helping to design some diagnostic software to identify any waste in the car assembly process. Do you mean waste of materials? No, time. Anything that can speed the process up helps to cut costs. How did the work placement compare to being a student? Was it hard work? Yes, it was. I'd had full-time work before. I've done various unskilled jobs during university holidays, and some of those involve long hours. So I thought I'd find it easy. I was wrong, though. I think when you're on placement, you're always trying to prove yourself. So you push yourself hard to succeed? Yes. But I got a lot of support from my employers. They were always helpful. 
And then, at the end of the placement, I was given formal feedback. Do you mean on your engineering ability? Well, no. I didn't really need that because we had team meetings every other day. And so I had the chance to discuss technical issues and ask about anything that wasn't clear. The evaluation was about general workplace things, like organizational ability, initiative, that sort of thing. I get the impression you think you benefited from the placement. Well, the best thing is that they've offered me a job for next year. Depending on my exam results, of course, but still. A permanent one? Yes. But apart from that, I learned so much. The industrial environment was much more demanding than the academic one, so my general skills improved, like time management, meeting deadlines. And on the technical side, I learned new software packages, like MS Project. Well, I think you've convinced me that work placements are worthwhile, but while you're here, can you give me advice on something else? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. I'm about to make a start on the engineering materials module and I've got a book list here. Can you have a quick look and tell me what you would recommend? That's if you can remember. Let's see. I do remember some of them. Hmm. Yes, this one. The Science of Materials. I found the subject quite hard generally, but this book is very accessible, so it suited me. It doesn't cover everything, though. What about this one, then? Materials Engineering? Oh, yes. I do remember that. But it's a bit out of date now, isn't it? Unless it's a new edition. I don't think so. But what I liked about it were the pictures. They really help to understand the descriptions. It's useful just from that point of view. Let's see. What else? Oh, yes. That one there. Engineering Basics. I think out of all these, that's got the widest coverage. But I've looked at the contents page and it hardly mentions nanotechnology. Yes, you're right. The evolution of materials does, though. It's a recent publication, so it covers all the latest developments. It's a bit thin on the 1960s, though, and that decade was quite important. Well, it sounds as if they all complement each other in some ways. I don't suppose you can lend me... That is the end of section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. In this section, you'll hear an introduction about the tutorial courses of the physics school. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Welcome to Orientation Week. This is the Physics School session, and we'll welcome Professor Smith, the head of the school, to introduce you to the tutorial system. Welcome, Professor Smith. Thank you. 
You may have noticed life at university is totally different from that of school. For you, tutorials are an important part of the teaching program. Tutors are the primary contact between undergraduate students and the school. A tutor is the student's personal tutor as well as their academic tutor. Tutorials for physics undergraduates consist of six students who meet each week with their tutor for at least fifty minutes. For radiographer students, tutorials will normally consist of a group of about ten students who will meet fortnightly with their tutor for a period of at least fifty minutes. In the first semester, the tutorials are during weeks one to eleven. For semester two, they are during weeks fourteen to twenty-four. Everybody involved is expected to be present and on time, and the tutor will also be available in week twelve and twenty-five to discuss problems that arise during revision. But attendance by students is optional. Now I'm going to introduce to you the stages and activities of the tutorials. The induction period is from week one to three. I know that a significant minority of you experience culture shock. During your first few months at university, and the important function of this stage is to identify students who are having difficulty integrating into the academic program. In particular, tutors should check your attendance of lectures, tutorials, laboratory sessions, and this sort of things. Tutors also help you tackle work in a systematic and effective manner. Stage two begins from the fourth week. Some tutorials of this period are to be devoted to discussion or going over the students' lecture notes, but approximately fifty percent of tutorial time is to be devoted to coursework. You should finish the weekly homework assignments of two hours duration with at least fifty percent involving written work. At least eight homework assignments during the year should involve answering problems set on coursework. The written work collected by the tutor. Should be marked within a week of handing in, and generally the assignments should be graded. The third stage starts from week eight till the tenth. During this period, math and four core physics programs are included. The majority of tutorial time should be devoted to work which supports the lecture programs and laboratory work. At least sixty percent of homework assignments should involve written work. The assignment may involve writing an account of or notes on a specified range of topics. The written work should also be marked and graded. Short oral presentations by students should be included. They are possibly on general physics topics or essays. The last week's personal development planning is a structured and supported process. The primary objective for PDP is to help you to become more independent and confident, self-directed learners, and encourage a positive attitude to learning throughout life. It is undertaken by yourselves to reflect upon their own learning, performance, and achievement, and to plan for their personal, educational, and career development. Finally, if without evidence of good reason you miss more than two sessions during a semester. Or if the tutor is not satisfied with your progress, the matter must be immediately referred to the program director, who will normally issue formal warning, verbal and written. This will inform you that your place at university is under threat of withdrawal if no improvement is made. That is the end of section four.